hello students so this is our first session which is anatomy and development of the eyeball now in this session we will be trying to get an overview of the anatomy of the eyeball we will not be discussing the each of the structures uh, in detail that we will be doing in the individual chapters but here we will try to analyze the anatomy of the globe as a whole we will try to look at how this globe develops so the embryological aspects of the eyeball we will cover and we will also look at the anomalies of development that can happen in the eyeball so let us start with uh, the basic how do you divide um, the eyeball so in order to look at the structures of the eye what do we first have to do obviously we have to create a section so what kind of section do you create you create a sagittal section so when i create a sagittal section like this and i get to look at the eyeball from the side then this is the picture that comes to me so now when we try to analyze the structures of the eyeball we will look at it as the structures in the wall which is called as the coats of the eyeball so what are the coats coats are the structures in the wall of the eyeball and what is the content obviously the name itself tells me what is the content it is what is inside the eyeball so the structures in the wall will be called as coats of the eyeball and the structures which are inside will be called as the contents of the eyeball now let us look at how many layers are there in the coats of the eyeball so if you look at this diagram see it has been very nicely color coded to help us to understand how many layers are there so see this outermost layer which they have coded in blue that is the outer coat then you can see this red line here that is the middle coat and then you can see this yellow that is the inner coat so there are three coats of the eyeball or three layers in the wall of the eyeball so the coats of the eyeball are we call them as outer fibrous coat outer fibrous coat middle vascular coat and inner nervous coat so outer fibrous coat middle vascular coat and the inner nervous coat these are the different coats of the eyeball now what are the parts of the outer fibrous coat of the eyeball the outer fibrous coat of the eyeball it consists of in front it consists of this that is the cornea so this is your cornea and the posterior part of this outer fibrous coat that is this whole thing behind this is your sclera so the outer fibrous coat it consists of the cornea and the sclera then the middle vascular coat so what are the parts of the middle vascular coat the middle vascular coat the front this one this structure here this is your iris if you trace the iris backward it becomes continuous with your ciliary body and if you trace the ciliary body further backwards it becomes continuous with the choroid so see the iris the ciliary body and the choroid these are the parts of your middle vascular coat so the middle vascular coat consists of the iris the ciliary body and the choroid and what about the inner nervous coat the inner nervous coat consists of your retina the inner nervous coat consists of the retina now we will try to learn each of these in detail so let us come to the cornea which is a part of the outer fibrous coat now this cornea this is this part in front so this is the anterior one sixth of the outer fibrous coat whereas the posterior five sixth that is this posterior five sixth of it this is your sclera now what is the main difference when you look at the cornea and the sclera the main difference is the cornea is transparent right whereas the sclera which is this white part that you see in the eye the sclera is opaque so the cornea it is transparent and why is it how does it help be by being transparent it acts as a refractive medium meaning it allows the light rays to pass inside the eye and it also bend the light rays why is it important to bend the light rays because the light rays only if they are bent will ultimately meet at a point here on the retina so this process of allowing the light rays to pass and also bending them to meet on the retina that is what is called as a refractive that is that is the process of refraction and the cornea does that and therefore it is called as a refractive medium now how about the sclera that is the posterior 5 6 as i told you the main difference is what the, the sclera is opaque 
So obviously, if it is opaque, it has no role to play in the process of refraction because it's not going to allow the light rays to pass. But it is very, very important because these are its functions. What are the functions of the sclera? The functions of the sclera are, see, it is a tough outer coat. So it protects the intraocular contents, right? It allows the insertion of the extraocular muscles. So the muscles are inserted and this is very response, very important for the movements of the eye. So because these muscles are inserted into the sclera, that's why when you move this way and this way, your eyes are able to move. So the insertion of the extraocular muscles and the transmission of the blood vessels and nerves, the transmission of the blood vessels and nerves. Now say posteriorly, this sclera here, is converted to a sieve like structure that is a structure like this with multiple holes that is called as the lamina cribrosa and through the lamina cribrosa the fibers of the optic nerve will pass so that is why we are saying that it allows the transmission of the blood vessels and nerves because it's the outer coat all the blood vessels have to enter inside and have to leave it by piercing the sclera and posteriorly it is converted to a sieve like structure which is called as the lamina cribrosa and this lamina cribrosa it allows the exit of the fibers of the optic nerve. So this is about our cornea and sclera. Now there is one more very important part of this outer fibrous coat and that is your corneoscleral junction that is the corneoscleral junction. Now, this corneoscleral junction, it has a name. It's called as the limbus. This corneoscleral junction, this is called as the limbus. The junction between the cornea and the sclera, that's called as the limbus. And this limbus is of tremendous importance in the eye. What is the importance of the limbus? The limbus is the storehouse of the ocular stem cells. And what is the importance of the stem cells? The stem cells are responsible for regeneration and repair of the ocular surface after any type of injury. So if there is any injury to the ocular surface, then the regeneration and the repair of that surface is a function of the limbus, which is the corneoscleral junction, right? So this is what we need to know about the outer fibrous coat. Now let me take you a step further. Let's look at the middle coat. The middle coat, as I told you, anteriorly, we have to look at the structures from anterior to posterior. The anterior most structure is this, which is the iris. Now, all of us know what is the iris. The brownish structure that you can see when you look into somebody's eye, that is the iris. And that is visible. Why? Because the cornea is transparent. It lies behind. And it is visible because the iris itself is opaque and the cornea is transparent. So, it's a circular disc-shaped structure. And at the center, there is an aperture which is called as the pupil, right? There, at the center, there is an aperture which is called as the pupil. Now, this iris is opaque, so it will not allow the light rays to pass through. But this pupil is an opening at the center, so it will allow the light rays to pass through. Now, see the diameter of the pupil can be changed. It varies. It is under the control of two muscles. What are the two muscles which control the diameter? It is the sphincter pupillae. It is the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. The sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. These are the two muscles which control the diameter of the pupil. And by doing that, they regulate how much of light is going to enter inside the eye. So the amount of light that enters inside the eye is controlled by changing the diameter of the pupil. So basically, if it is bright light, in bright light, the pupil constricts with the help of the sphincter pupillae muscle. And that limits the amount of light that is going to enter inside. So see, this is the margin of the pupil here. So the pupil is constricted because the light is bright. But suppose if there is dim light or there is in darkness, the pupil is going to dilate. So he, this is the diameter of the pupil here. Right? So that the pupil dilates to allow more light to enter inside the eye. So that is why the main function of the iris is it regulates the amount of light entering into the eye by constriction and dilatation of the pupil. So it decreases or increases the diameter of the pupil and thereby regulates how much of light is going to enter inside the eye. So in bright light, it makes it smaller so that only less amount of light will enter inside. Whereas in dim light, 
makes it larger so that more light can enter inside the eye. Now, apart from this, the iris has another function that is it is it provides color to the eye. The color of the eye is a function of the iris. So, see in case of westerners, we have often seen that we have light colored iris whereas in case of in our population, we have a dark colored iris. So, this is one of the features which is responsible for identification of the individual and we also have iris recognition technology. Iris recognition technology, it is going to help us to identify an individual. So, this iris therefore is one of the important features for eye color and also for identification of an individual. So, this is the function of the iris. Now, if we trace the iris backwards, it becomes continuous with the ciliary body. Now, what does the ciliary body do? The ciliary body, it is divided into two parts. This front part which contains these projections, this part of the ciliary body, this has a name. This is called as the pars plicata. This part of the ciliary body, it is called as the pars plicata. Whereas the posterior part of the ciliary body, that is this part which is flat, this which doesn't contain these projections, this is called as your pars plana. Pars plicata and pars plana. Right? Now, what do you think this ciliary body does? If you look at this image, you will see that this ciliary body has got these threads attached to it and these threads, they are called as the zonules and what they essentially do is, they help to keep this lens in its position. So, this structure that you see here, this is your crystalline lens and keeping the crystalline lens in its position is a function of the ciliary body.